Okay. Uh, for people who just started this fall, I'm Michael Simpson. I'm the chair of the Environmental Studies Department, but since I've been on sabbatical, you may not know who I am, so I just wanted to start with that. Also, I want to wholeheartedly thank uh, Board of Trustee member Nancy Grant and her husband David Grant. They provided me the opportunity to have lunch with the speaker this summer and uh, start a dialogue with, with Gus and as a result, he is here today. And so I, I do want to thank them for the, for the contact and the opportunity. Um, I'm very happy to have Gus Speth here today. Uh, he has always been one of my heroes in the environmental field. And if you just want to understand the depth of his wisdom and the breadth of his knowledge uh, after graduating from Yale, uh, Yale and then going on as a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford and then coming back to the Yale Law School, uh, he decided to start the National Resource Defense Council um, and was a co-founder there. And he also started the World Resources Institute um, in, in his spare time. Um, he has worked uh, directly for two presidents. He was the chair of the Council of Environmental Quality under, under Jimmy Carter, and he was uh, on the transition team for President-elect Clinton when he came on board. Um, he has numerous awards. Uh, I will just n name some of them. He has the National Wildlife Federation's Resource Defense Award, the Nat Natural Resource Council of America's Barbara Swain Award of Honor, Special Recognition Award from the Society of International Development, a Lifetime Achievement Award of the Environment from the Law Institute, and a Blue Planet Prize. He currently is a professor of law at Vermont Law School, and I'm lucky to have him next door as a neighbor in, in South Stratford, Vermont. So for, with that, no further ado, Gus, the podium's yours. What a pleasure to see everybody uh, on this lovely day. Thank you for coming, and thank you, for Michael, for the introduction and, uh, and for this opportunity. Uh, I picked up uh, from Nancy uh, and from Abby and Michael before this concept of uh, the engaged scholar, and uh, I really applaud what you're doing here with your breadth and you're getting out into the field and doing practical things as well as academic things and being engaged. Uh, it, it is a good model for academia, and, and it's a good model for life, right? Um, well, how long has it been since the first Earth Day, right? 44 years. I mean, we've been at this now for 44 years, and uh, uh, I will try to make the point with you today that it's now time to rethink. Uh, it's time to take a step back and look at where we've been and where we haven't been and, and think about how we should go forward uh, from here. Uh, uh, we look back, uh, I mean, since the first Earth Day, uh, we've accomplished some serious things in, in, in protecting the environment. Uh, it can't be, can't be doubted. On the other hand, uh, here we are, 44 years after Earth Day, on the cusp of ruining the planet, quite literally. Uh, for our children and grandchildren. Uh, it is, on balance, I would submit a spectacular failure, uh, despite the fact that our organizations have grown stronger and more sophisticated with more members and bigger budgets. Uh, here we are. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it takes sometimes uh, somebody to remind us of the, the headlines uh, that we've been living through because we, it's so easy to forget uh, from one day to another. We have this amnesia. But uh, you may remember that back in May, uh, NASA and others released two major reports uh, concluding that the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet is unstoppable. Some say likely unstoppable, almost unstoppable. But it looks like we've committed ourselves to the collapse of this huge ice sheet which could lead to uh, uh, a huge amount of, of sea level rise, uh, perhaps another yard of sea level rise in this uh, century. Um, AP science writer, scientists say that climate is in a spiral. 
uh, that the new emissions deal with China won't halt or change the picture materially. Um, another estimate is that to do the right thing by climate, we're going to have to live, leave somewhere between two-thirds and 80 percent of the fossil resource in the Earth. That's estimated to be at least a $28 trillion write-down that the fossil fuel companies uh, should, will, should, should make. Uh, people talk a lot about natural gas uh, substituting for coal helping us. The latest study shows that, uh, on balance, it doesn't. Uh, report just the other day in November 17, a coal rush in India could tip balance on climate change. In other words, it's not just China building all those coal-fired power plants, uh, it's now India as well. Uh, climate shocker, a warming ocean creates great plumes of methane bubbles, uh, potent greenhouse gas, much more so than, than CO2. Uh, we're, we, we could go on about the desperate seriousness of the climate issue. I think it's a tsunami that's just waiting. Uh, we're seeing the early effects of us, but it's a tsunami right offshore. Uh, and, of course, there are other global-scale problems of utmost seriousness. Uh, since uh, the first Earth Day, the estimate is that uh, half the, vertebrate, the, the popula vertebrate population of the planet has been halved. Uh, huge losses uh, of, uh, of fauna uh, and flora, uh, and more predicted. Uh, and, on and on, this prob these problems don't go away. We think about uh, the fact that these are global scale issues, and they are, but we, you know, we should remember that a, a third of the rivers and a half of the lakes in our country still don't meet the goal that we set for the mid-1980s of the fishable and swimmable waters. Um, you know, that we're, we're losing uh, undeveloped land to, to various forms of development in this country at a rate of about 600 acres a day. Um, that uh, huge proportions of our species, uh, uh, for example, perhaps 40 percent of the fish species are vulnerable uh, to extinction. And I could go on and on, uh, but you, this is your field, you know these statistics, you know how uh, bad the situation is. So I submit when you confront this, uh, this paradox of growing strength in the environmental community and loss on a vast scale, you have to, we have to take a step back and, and, and go back to basics and, um, and, and, and ask ourselves uh, what, what has been going wrong and what do we need uh, to do uh, differently. And uh, I would argue uh, that uh, 44 years after the first Earth Day uh, is time for something different, very different. We need a new environmentalism. And the core of this new environmentalism has got to be the shaping of a fundamentally different economy, the shaping of a new political economy uh, in our country. Uh, and to do that, we're going to have to build a very different politics uh, to get there. Uh, it's time to ask the basic question, what is an environmental issue? If we answer that in the traditional way, it's air pollution, water pollution, biodiversity, climate, the agenda that I saw a major environmental group recently unfold in its new strategic plan, 44 years after the first Earth Day. But in the context of these losses, in the context of this incredible failure, uh, perhaps we should answer that question differently. So what is an environmental issue? I would argue that an environmental issue is any issue that has a big effect on environmental outcomes. So any issue that has a big effect on, in determining our prospects for success in sustaining the environment and regenerating the environment for future generations. And once we pose the question like that, then right away it becomes clear, doesn't it, that, uh, that uh, the biggest thing that affects environmental outcomes is the health of our politics, the health of our democracy, the, the prospect of people power, uh, uh, and its eclipse uh, by the ascendancy of money power and corporate power. Uh, 
Uh, that is, that's a huge determinant of environmental outcomes. And yet our mainline environmental groups don't really address these issues and, and main, remain today uh, far too far removed from the political process and getting involved directly. I mean, compare that with the Tea Party. Uh, whatever you think of it, people got into politics. They got political power. And uh, we have not done that. We've not been a political uh, movement. Uh, think about the, uh, the social dimensions. Uh, what another huge determinant of environmental outcomes is, is the fact that uh, this, this vast social insecurity in our country. Uh, people are scared. Uh, people are scared of for their jobs. They're scared for their incomes. Uh, the bottom is falling out of the middle class. When Mitch McConnell wants to argue against uh, uh, even the modest uh, steps that the president is trying to take to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants, what, what do you hear? It'll hurt the economy. It'll cost jobs. It'll raise prices. Uh, and people listen because they are losing jobs. They have low-paying jobs now. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have this um, about half the country living paycheck to paycheck. People aren't saving anymore. Uh, we have 40 percent of the American families, low-income families, meaning their incomes are less than, uh, than 150 percent of the poverty level. Uh, so we have these huge social insecurity issues uh, in the country, uh, poverty at an all-time high. Uh, inequality at levels we haven't seen since uh, the 20s. And, uh, and this is a huge uh, burden on the prospects for really doing something. Because people, you know, unless environmentalists address the issues of social justice, address the issues of racial justice and class justice and gender justice uh, in our society, uh, we're not going to be able to move forward uh, on, on environment. Take another issue, which um, is a huge determinant of environmental outcomes, and that's uh, our affluenza, uh, our materialism, uh, our misguided values that put so much emphasis on now and the individual uh, and material uh, drop to your shop, or was it the other way around? Uh, <laughs> and um, and we you know we have this influenza and. Uh, and, and yet this, this question of our lifestyles, uh, of our values, it's pretty much off limits to the environmental community as, as we know it. There's no big challenge uh, to, to us and to the advertising, including advertising to children, uh, which is so out of control. Uh, so all of these things are among the underlying drivers of environmental loss today. The, the things that are preventing us from, from moving forward. And I, I think it's Im imperative that we see these issues as environmental issues and that people that are concerned about the environment figure out ways to deal with these issues as well as the traditional problems. We've got to go at the drivers. Uh, and I, I have a paragraph that I'm very fond of uh, because I've, I've written it now enough times to really believe it. Um, <laughs> And um, I'm going to inflict it on you. Uh, our environmental problems are rooted in defining features of the current political economy. An unquestioning society-wide commitment to economic growth at any cost, a measure of that growth GDP that includes everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it should be grossly distorted picture. Um, a powerful corporate interest whose overriding objective is to grow by generating profit, including the profit they make from avoiding the environmental costs that they create, markets that systematically fail to recognize these environmental costs unless corrected by government, and government that's subservient to the corporate interest and the growth imperative, a rampant consumerism spurred endlessly on by sophisticated advertising, Social injustice and economic insecurity so vast that they empower the often false claims that needed measures would slow growth or hurt the economy or cost us jobs. And economic activity now so large in scale uh, that its impacts alter the fundamental biophysical 
operations of the planet. Those, that's a, a syndrome. This is an economy that is, uh, that is programmed. Uh, this is the operating system uh, that we have. Uh, and if we want to really get to the root and, and to really succeed, we're going to have to attack this system. Uh, and we're going to have to develop a new operating system, a new political economy that's programmed to deliver good results for people, and good results for place, and good results for planet. And that's a mouthful, right? That's more than a mouthful. That's a huge challenge. How do we even begin to think about moving to a new political economy, uh, one that gets us out of the failing one that we live and work in uh, today? I, I, have, I know of no way to really think about it other than to identify those features of the current economy that seem to be giving rise to such trouble for us and to uh, identify the, the policy and other initiatives that are needed to change or rewire or reprogram the system by fundamentally altering those features that are the root of the problem. And I won't you know, go into, uh, I have a, a dozen such uh, transitions that I think we, uh, we need to make uh, well, certainly a transition in our values, uh, certainly um, a transition in our perspective towards a prioritization of growth, GDP growth, that is, uh, a transition in the corporation away from the dominant model that we have today to uh, a new corporation, which we could discuss and, and, and define, but is coming into being in many places around the country on a small scale. Um, a, um, a transition in, in money and finance. Who, who really controls the direction of investment in, in the country? Uh, is, it, um, is, it, is, it in, is it local or is it, is it big banks? Uh, is, it, does there, is there a strong democratic input uh, on the direction of finance and investment? Uh, you know, we, we know there's not. Uh, we know the banks not only make the money, but make the decisions about uh, where it should go and, uh, and be invested. And it seeks high financial returns. There may be huge other investments, and indeed are, that have huge environmental returns, uh, huge social returns. But there's so little democratic control over the direction of money and finance uh, that we miss those, those great opportunities. And now we, we suffer from them. So there are a host of these features of the current order uh, that we need to attack. But certainly one of them is the ascendancy of money power over people power. And I think the country needs to come together quickly before it's too late to address this creeping corporatocracy and creeping plutocracy uh, in the country with a series of, of deep pro-democracy pro political reforms. And, you know, I have, uh, again, another list uh, that uh, is not a, a unique. Uh, and, but one of the things that, uh, that I think is most attractive is something called the American Anti-Corruption Act. And this was drafted by, uh, in part, by the lovely uh, Trevor Potter, who made a momentary appearance in the Colbert uh, show as his super PAC advisor. You may remember him. He was almost as funny as uh, Colbert was. But they drafted this American Anti-Corruption Act. And what it says is, among other things, it has a lot of provisions, but one of them says, if you are a member of a legislative committee at any level of government that's regulating industry X, so example, the banking industry, you cannot take campaign contributions from that industry. It's just a simple, ethical, anti-corruption proposition that should have a wide appeal. There are many other things we need to be doing, like securing the vote, guaranteeing the vote, making it easy to vote, getting beyond uh, partisan gerrymandering, uh, and uh, a host of other things that uh, we could, uh, could enumerate. But we've got to save our politics, because so many of the things that we need to do require government uh, action. When we were young, uh, there really wasn't an argument about whether we needed strong, effective, and competent government. And for those of us who went into the environmental movement in 
in 1970, uh, late 60s, uh, we had seen that government operate to secure civil rights in the United States. Uh, we had seen the passage of uh, path-breaking legislation in, in 1964 and 65. We had seen the importance of getting issues to Washington, uh, where you could get a national solution to a national problem. And, um, and, 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 and now we have this, uh, we're, we're saddled with this uh, awful uh, ideology of uh, anti-government, anti-regulation, anti-tax, uh, and we need to, you know, get our act together as a society and, and begin to form the kinds of political alliances. Uh, we, we need a movement to do that, and to get the kind of movement that we need, uh, we need to get out of our silos. And I was so pleased to see things here. Uh, like um, a program in advocacy for social justice and sustainability, right? I mean, uh, you, we need to, to, to build a, a common progressive coalition that unites progressives across all stripes. We have that on the right, uh, uh, but we need to develop a common agenda, uh, uh, backbone organizations that, that link up all the progressive causes, uh, common messaging, uh, common prioritization, uh, and, and building a powerful uh, grassroots force uh, out of all the progressive movements. Uh, so in New York the other day, we had 400,000 people uh, walking in the streets and uh, ostensibly to address the UN's uh, climate conference, but it was much broader, right? It was much broader. We had uh, people uh, who were there we're concerned about all of the fossil fuel insults across all the fuel cycles of each of the major fossil fuels. But we also had people there that were concerned about women's issues and gay rights issues and a host of other issues that had come together. And this is the kind of coalition we need to build and build at the grassroots and really take back our country uh, before uh, it's too late. Um, there's a different approach that gets you pretty much to the same place. And that is to appreciate uh, that it's not just environment that is suffering in today's world, right? We have huge social issues, uh, some of which I've, I've mentioned. We have a failing politics, which I've mentioned. Uh, we have an economy that is now back up to where it was in GDP terms before the 2008 uh, recession, and we still have huge underemployment, uh, huge economic insecurity, a lot of low-wage jobs having been created, and, and a real threat to, to our people, uh, huge economic problems. And so when you have encompassing problems emerge across the whole spectrum of national life, it can't be due to small causes. It can't be due to a neglect here or a failure to do something about education there. I looked at, um, at uh, a cross-section of the 20 advanced industrial democracies, mostly Europe, U.S., Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and then I looked at 30 different indicators of national well-being. Uh, how are we doing in education? How are we doing on health care, social mobility, uh, poverty, uh, inequality, and environmental performance? And what I found was that among that sample of 20 countries, uh, we are at the bottom. The U.S. is either at the very bottom or very close to it across this whole list of 30 uh, major measures of, of national uh, well-being and performance and progress. Uh, so when you have a situation like that, you have to conclude, I think, that you're dealing with a system that's failing. It's not just that we failed here and failed there. We're working and living in a system that is systematically delivering bad results. And if we want to address all of these issues, because they are all artifacts, all products of this system, we need to change the system. But one first step is to get people talking about the need to see the system as the problem, the need to see systemic changes as part of the solution and not just incremental reforms. And uh, we need to legitimize the discussion 
uh, of system change. We need to get beyond Margaret Thatcher's there is no alternative. Uh, so prominent in, in, in our discourse that it's become an acronym. Uh, people say, hey, Tina. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so this is, uh, but so we need to start having this national conversation uh, on the next system. And if any of you are particularly interested in this, um, uh, let me mention a few things. At first, uh, we have a, a, uh, a project that we're carrying forward uh, called the Next System Project. And we have a statement which basically doesn't provide all the answers, but it says, in effect, uh, uh, a good bit of what I've said about the uh, critique uh, and the need to have a new system and to have uh, open and honest uh, discussion facilitated by the media of new system alternatives. And uh, so we have this Next System Project. Uh, we've also created a, 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 a network of, of organizations uh, called the New Economy Coalition, which is grounded on the idea of, of system change uh, and uh, now has about 130 national uh, organ organizational members uh, scattered across the country, many of them national groups like Friends of the Earth and, uh, and, many, uh, and groups like uh, National People's Alliance and uh, Domestic Workers Alliance and others. There's quite a spectrum of organizations, but unified with the idea uh, that we need to work together to build uh, a new economy, a new system uh, of political economy. Um, so what could happen? How might this happen? Um, well, uh, we need first, I think, to, be, to recognize the importance of, of crises in driving real change. Milton Friedman's uh, famous statement that became the basis of Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine. Um, the only crises uh, produce real change. So our mandate is to be crisis ready. Our mandate is to do the things that get us ready uh, to make uh, progressive progress and systemic changes when the next crises come. For well, surely they will. Environmental. I think the climate issues, as I said, are just a tsunami right offshore. Uh, economic crises, the banking industry is in no better shape than it was in 2007. Uh, they're no more risk averse. Uh, they, uh, their reserve requirements are no higher. Uh, and we're, we will almost certainly be buffeted by, uh, by crises of, of numerous types. Um, being crisis ready means that we have started to implant in the society, in the dialogue at least, in the discussion in public discourse, ideas of deep change, policies that could make a huge difference. Uh, and um, you know, and I've written books about them. I won't bother you with them, but there are plenty of ideas out there for policies that could drive deep change across this whole spectrum. Uh, of issues, but those ideas need to be out of the books and into public discourse with advocacy groups pushing them so that you know, when the crises came, come, they are available. Similarly, um, a vision. You know, the policies aim towards a vision. What, is, what, what world do we really want for our children and grandchildren? We need a powerful vision of how uh, of, of that world. And when I was doing research on the, a couple of my books, uh, I, I found that it was, yeah, there wasn't that much, you know. We need depictions, uh, we need narratives, uh, stories of, about that world uh, and uh, that can galvanize people's energies, uh, mobilize uh, their concerns and affections and resonate uh, with people's uh, hearts. Um, and um, in addition, um, you know, we need to be organized. Uh, we need to be ready organizationally. We need to be together as, as progressive communities. Uh, we need to have networks of networks and networks and, and people need to be communicating and, uh, and, and ready to go. We hopefully at that moment of crisis will have transformative leadership uh, and, and not bad leadership. Uh, uh, you know, national leaders can make a huge difference. Um, and um, we need to have our values in play. Uh, 
Uh, we, uh, you know, in this room, uh, yeah, I think we have lots of people who uh, have transcended materialism, have, uh, uh, you know, are thinking about tomorrow and not just uh, today. Uh, and uh, so we need our faith communities uh, uh, to help us uh, have these metalogues about the values uh, that we need to be, uh, that need to be in play. Uh, and lastly, when the crises come, we want people to look around and see the future already in the present, in our communities. Examples of things that, that, uh, that represent the way the future uh, can be. And, and whether it's new types of corporations operating at the local level, uh, social enterprises, public-private hybrids, profit-not-for-profit hybrids, uh, co-ops, local banks, state banks, uh, all kinds of things that represent the future uh, uh, can, you know, can be created and are being created uh, across our, our great country uh, today. And, uh, and there are other things that we can be doing in terms of transition towns, in terms of uh, the food movement uh, and carrying the food, what the food model forward into local uh, manufacturing and uh, local uh, rooted industries of uh, of, uh, and, and sort of import substitution and, 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 and a system uh, in communities where we really have uh, done everything that we can do at that level to bring fam pro-family and pro-child policies uh, into, into being uh, with decent minimum wages and decent wages and uh, family leave policies and protection of part-time workers and, and uh, paid vacations. Uh, uh, we need to be trying to get these things done so that when the moment comes and we do are in the midst of a crisis, people will look up and see that this is a better world being born out there, and these are models that we can build on and replicate uh, until they go to scale. Thank you very much. Please speak up. Um, well, I'm going to start. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about the new economy, um, what scale do you think is the most effective scale of transition to a new system as far as the, you know, where the economy operates effectively? Well, you have different, um, uh, different models, uh, so to speak. And I think... Uh, one of the best depictions of, uh, of transformation uh, and, and what it might look like has been done by the TELUS Institute in Boston, where they have uh, described um, this uh, great transition initiative. And, uh, and in this uh, sort of new sustainability world or, or new economy world that they describe, uh, they they depict uh, pretty fully, uh, not, you know, a few pages each, uh, uh, what the world might look like in that, uh, in that future. And um, uh, uh, at the most conservative end of the spectrum is something they call kind of uh, 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 Sweden's third way cubed, uh, which is a world that's very, an economy that's very interconnected, that still has a <laughs> A large uh, a private sector, uh, but which in which values the values that are motivating everybody in all uh, uh, all walks of that economy are have been really transformed. So that it is a uh, uh, it, it looks in some ways like today's economy, but but people's values have shifted dramatically. There's a powerful resonance with nature. There's a powerful social solidarity, and uh, and there's a lot of regulation, and the, the commons has been wrested back uh, from the, the corporate sector. Uh, another one that they depict uh, is, a, uh, is, is really a kind of modern version of a socialist economy uh, in which uh, there's a lot of public ownership 
Uh, there, there are a lot of community development corporations. There are, uh, uh, it's uh, economic democracy uh, might be a better way of putting it because there's a lot of worker ownership and worker control. Uh, and, uh, and it occupies kind of an intermediate uh, scale, so to speak, in terms of connectivity with the larger world. Um, and, uh, and then there's one they call Arcadia. Uh, which is the most decentralized, uh, the real blooming of, uh, of localism, uh, of, of, act, of uh, uh, you know, there, there's some high-tech uh, manufacturing, but people have opted for you know, rather dramatic uh, downshifting uh, for more natural lifestyles. Um, some would disparage it by perhaps calling it eco-communalism, uh, but, but they see all of these uh, possibilities uh, out there for, for different parts of the world, uh, within a country, uh, between countries, among countries, and, um, and, and it's not just sort of one, one monolithic idea of the future. There are uh, lots of futures that work. They have different uh, scales of life uh, and uh, ranging from, you know, a, a real embrace of, of globalization beyond the economic uh, route that, that we have now uh, to, uh, to, to people who've uh, decided to live very local lives and to concentrate on local enterprise and, and, and local schools and, and on and like that. So I, I encourage you to look up um, you know, the TELUS work if you're, if you're not familiar with it. Um, yeah, is that a hand going up? Please. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I was wondering um, if you think that play, will play into moving forward with some model of a new economy or some of the shifts that you're talking about, because in some of the writing that's going on now about this big demographic shift, they're trying to look at how that influences a lot of what's happening, and I was trying to think about how much of an impact that might really have. Well, I'm, uh, I, you know, just a couple of things on the population issue. One is that it wasn't that long ago, maybe, well, things, actually, maybe it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, I remember 20 years ago, at least, and maybe uh, as long, as recently as 15 years ago, uh, you know, we seemed to be in the midst of a, of a demographic transition that could level off world populations uh, as low as... Uh, as you know, eight billion or eight and a half billion, and, and now the the sort of projections are for much more, much bigger population growth in the years between, say, now and 2050. Uh, so we're going to have a lot more people. Yes, there will be an age shift in there. Um, I don't really uh, know exactly uh, what that means, but I think one thing it means is that uh, fewer people will be supporting uh, the population as a whole. There will be fewer working age people. Uh, and, uh, but um, the other thing is you mentioned the demographic transition. Uh, I mean, I think one reason that we do have this extra, extra uh, couple of billion people coming is, um, is because we have so badly uh, funded and carried out uh, international programs uh, because we, you know, what we know is that, um, is that, you know, if you invest heavily in maternal and child health care, if you invest heavily in education for girls, uh, heavily in uh, uh, opportunities for women, employment and, and otherwise, um, and non-coercive uh, family planning services uh, making them really available. Uh, fertility rates tend to go down, and we have underfunded that plan of action uh, hugely uh, at the international level. Uh, at one point, it, I, it was about half the funding that was committed at the Cairo conference. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is all uh, playing out uh, uh, in, in our world, and it, uh, you know, it bears for, for the study. 
Um, and we need to find out a way to talk about the population issue in our own country rather than sounding like board of vigilantes or something. Uh, it's, a, it's a serious issue and, uh, uh, and it is part of the problem. On the other hand, if you sort of compare the impact of, um, of, uh, of an extra person versus the impact of, uh, of an extra GDP per person in terms of its environmental effects, uh, you know, the affluence is a much bigger factor. Uh, the growth of, uh, of GDP is a much bigger factor than the growth of population in terms of uh, causing these problems. And, and there are people who would just say, oh, it's all too many people, but it's not. It's, uh, it's just the real driver uh, and the thing that really correlates with so many of the bad trends uh, is this phenomenal uh, GDP growth. Yes, behind. Yes. Um, so, Gus, thank you for this. Um, I have several things going through my mind, but I have to discard most of them so I can focus. Um, it seems to me that the things that you're uh, advocating um, require a really fundamental uh, change of commitment uh, toward <clears throat> life as a whole, as opposed to uh, the human society that's somehow distinct from that. And I think it's, I, I can certainly say for myself, and I think it's probably, I, I think it's probably fair for, for most, of, most Americans that our fundamental commitment is to what we've been taught to be secure, a sense of security and prosperity and uh, belonging to a particular nation. And that really our fundamental commitment, even, even for, for, for us who call ourselves environmentalists, we have sort of a basic, maybe even unconscious commitment to the status quo, that after all, this is the society we were born into and raised in, and we've had you know, 50, 60 years of very sophisticated brainwashing through advertising to, to you know, have formed our, our psyches around this system. And, and, and I see that as kind of a barricade that we stumble over even when we say, yeah, I want this system to change, there is this really deep kind of visceral unconscious commitment to the status quo because it's what I know, it's what I was raised in, it's what the society models. Um, how, well, there's do also see, how do you see the transition where we can really shift our commitment to the totality of life, uh, even if that uh, challenges my personal sense of prosperity, advancing, you know, making, being somebody within this society. Right. Well, I, I wish I could uh, have, you know, everyone uh, in the world um, read the great Thomas Berry uh, and, uh, and his vision of the great work and uh, he, uh, his wonderful summation, which was that, um, uh, we humans uh, created the concept of rights and then gave them all to ourselves. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so similarly with, uh, with the great Aldo, uh, Leopold, uh, and the land ethic, uh, these were both magnificent efforts to, you know, put uh, us back in nature and to see nature and other life as something that has intrinsic rights, whatever we might think about it. And uh, I, think, um, I think our faith communities are turning to that. Uh, Thomas Berry was a, a priest uh, at, at one time, anyhow. Uh, and um, and, and, and we, we need our, our faith communities to help us uh, embrace uh, this, uh, uh, this natural ethic uh, and transcend our anthropocentrism. Uh, we had a resolution, a warning, in the town of Stratford, I think two years ago now, and it, it, was, a, it was intended to be a resolution that would embrace the rights of nature, uh, a resolution that would um, uh, assert the uh, town's uh, prerogatives over uh, corporations. Uh, but uh, there was a mistake made in the drafting and 
the word uh, anthropocentric uh, got into this uh, language of the warning in town. And, uh, and I don't know, uh, anyhow, the, the town meeting uh, became a, a discussion of, uh, of the word anthropocentric. <laughs> and uh, why anybody would want to put this into uh, a town uh, action. And uh, so finally someone suggested that, um, that why don't we just take the last half of the resolution out of it uh, and pass the first half, which didn't have the word anthropocentric in it. So we did. Um, but we, uh, it, 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 you know, I think values uh, can change. Uh, we can have a values uh, transition. And we know a lot of the factors that do change values. And that we don't have to just sit on our hands and, and wait uh, for it to happen. Um, values change. Uh, I asked a group of psychologists, and I know that many of you are in this field, uh, you know, what, um, what could lead to sort of a national epiphany, a national conversion experience? And, uh, you know, the, the answer I got back most commonly was uh, a crisis, uh, a crisis that really shakes up uh, uh, people and, 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 and destabilizes this uh, affection for the status quo that you talked about. The status quo is seen as failing. It's a systemic uh, crisis, if you will. And, um, and I think we, uh, you know, back to this theme of being prepared, I think we need to be prepared for that. Uh, education in, of all forms, including continuing education and social marketing and other things can be very important uh, in, uh, in, in shaping uh, values. Um, our religious, our faith communities can be of enormous help and uh, there's probably no way to reach so many people so quickly. Uh, if, if we could only see it happen uh, as, uh, as from the pulpit, so to speak. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and I think um, actually changing things on the ground, uh, as I mentioned earlier, can, can shape our values because, it, you know, seeing is believing. Uh, so there's a lot that, that we can do. Um, there was a, a quote from... Um, Moynihan, Patrick Daniel Moynihan, that I thought was very appropriate. Uh, um, he said the uh, central conservative truth is that values really matter. Uh, and the central liberal truth is that a society can rise to the occasion and change its values. And uh, I, I think this whole area of a value transition, you know, we could talk about all the other policy shifts but uh, unless they're accompanied by this transition in, in values uh, away from anthropocentrism and materialism and contempocentrism, and, uh, we won't get very far. And if you look at, for example, at the, um, uh, this family of scenarios that the Telus Institute has developed, which pretty much embrace everything from barbarization uh, to nirvana, uh, it, then uh, you know, the difference between success in these scenarios and, and, and failure uh, is a value transformation, a value shift. Uh, without that, it doesn't work uh, over, over time. Yes, please. I uh, spent a month this fall teaching environmental law in India, and uh, it's apparent to me that one of our greatest and worst exports is affluenza. So how do we, um, in, in the face of your suggestion to build a new economy, is that sufficient to model for India and China in particular a new economy? My concern is, uh, and this isn't at all critical, are we rearranging deck chairs as the ship is going down if we're not mindful of what's happening globally? I mean, yes. Uh, in, in, yes, uh, yes and no. Um, you know, we are um, uh, the model for a lot of the world, uh, one way or the other. And, uh, and, and, you know, what we do here has a big effect on, on people's attitudes, on, uh, on people's behavior uh, around the world. Um, and, um, 
I think we, uh, you know, we, we uh, and, but of course, uh, you know, we have to act in concert with the other countries or, or it won't, in the climate, for example, uh, I mentioned this, this shift in India towards uh, coal. I mean, this is coming on the heels of long-term uh, en engagement with the coal sector in, the, in, in China. And uh, so I think um, uh, the biggest problem, though, for me, uh, having worked abroad uh, like you uh, and, um, and uh, seen, the, you know, seen the, what's going on is it, we just take this climate issue. If we don't act now on climate, you know, the rest of the world is not going to do what they need to do. Uh, and, and we've been setting, you know, a bad role model. So, you know, I would, I, I think there, are, there's such good examples of uh, of doing things better around the world uh, in almost every area than we do. We could, you know, learn a lot from the rest of the world uh, as well. Um, and but it's. Uh, um, it's going to um, uh, take a, a different level of commitment to internationalism a, as well, and and uh, and getting beyond this idea of uh, American exceptionalism. Uh, you know. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's just take one more question because it is time for people to start moving uh, to classes. So I I support passionately everything you said today, but I also know that the way I live my life. And I think if you were to describe with brutal honesty the changes that I would have to make and everybody in this room would have to make to fit in this new economy, we would likely be appalled. Uh, take a case in point. The parking lot behind the university today is full. In this new economy that you described, that, that you want us to long for, that parking lot's going to have to be empty. Uh, I drove 30 miles to hear you today. In this new economy, I won't be able to do that. In fact, you wouldn't have been able to drive here yourself. And I think we need to really take seriously how that's going to affect me, this college. I mean, what these changes are radical and that we need to make. And I'm not sure that we're all ready to make them, <laughs> but we don't know how to make them. I think we're caught in a dilemma of knowing how to make that transition. Well, as you know, probably uh, as well as I, the, the, you know, there's a lot of, of, of fiction, I mean, serious fictional uh, books uh, <laughs> about, uh, you know, about the future. And they range all the way from uh, William Howard Kunstler uh, on the one hand uh, and um, the great book, the, the Witch of Hebron, if you haven't read it. Uh, but, you know, he, he has his vision of what it's going to take. And it's a uh, it, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it goes in, you know, the, the, the nearest analogy is, is going back uh, to, the, to the early 19th century, uh, basically, uh, in terms of uh, number of people and technology and, and other things. Uh, I think we uh, can present a, a positive vision of, of the future uh, that's honest. And I, I tried to do that uh, uh, in America the Possible. And I, I believe that it's possible to, to envision a, a plausible future uh, that's very attractive. Uh, and, uh, and I think we know a lot about uh, how to get there. Um, there's a lot we don't know. And there's a lot of experimentation that will have to be done and a lot of trial and error. Uh, but um, but it, uh, it, it struck me that this, um, you know, that the future that I describe in that book is uh, is is both attractive and uh, and plausible. There are things that we could do that would make it implausible, like let the climate issues uh, spin uh, out of control. Uh, but um, it, it's going to be difficult. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and and the changes, uh, you know, will be will be wrenching. Um, but, you know, the other thing I just will conclude with is that, you know, we don't have to know everything to start. We don't have to know all the answers. Uh, we just need to know the directionality of change that's needed, uh, some sense of the pace of change that's needed, 
and enough good ideas uh, to get started. Thank you. Thanks, Gus. Um, you met all my expectations in the world. <laughs> just to let you know, Gus just released his latest book. It just came out, Angels by the River. And if you do get a copy, he's agreed to sit here and use his pen and put a signature on it. So take this advantage. And thank you again. Thank you.